Good afternoon, like Matt said, my name is Elizabeth Brookie and I'm here with Nicole Franklin and we're going to be talking about publishing, contracts, kind of the differences between self-publishing and traditional publishing, some key clauses to look out for. Um, so we've kind of split and you can follow along, we have handouts if you haven't received one, but on page three we have an overview, we're going to talk about a copyright overview just some, as it relates specifically to publishing, we'll try to key it in there. Um, and we're going to talk about the benefits and challenges of self-publishing, some legal issues to watch out for, then we'll move on to traditional publishing and some clauses or um, legal issues to look for in those contracts. And then lastly, just kind of a quick summary of key things to remember when you're negotiating contracts with, with publishers. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Nicole first to give an overview of um, just kind of copyright. And just keep in mind in this presentation that, you know, uh, we're not legal advice, um, and if we do reference any third parties here, that we're you know we're not endorsing those third parties. I just had to give you my legal disclaimer, <laughs> since we are both lawyers. <laughs> but thank you for coming. Yeah. So it's great to be here again. Uh, my name is Nicole Sally Franklin. Um, we were here a year ago, and uh, so it's great to be back and speak to this group again. My section just deals with copyright law in case you weren't here the last time. So it's a brief overview just to give you a foundation. And uh, basically that foundation will then key into what Elizabeth's going to talk about as well. Is the volume okay, the way I'm talking now? Okay, great. So let's just start with the definition of copyright. The actual statute says uh, anything, uh, it's an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium for more than a transitory period of time. What the heck does that mean? Okay, if you break it down, it simply means it's either something that's written or captured that's basically um, on a piece of paper or it's recorded where you can see it for more than, say, 30 seconds. So if someone goes and uh, writes in the sky, you know, the airplanes that write in the sky, I wouldn't say that's copyrighted. That, Writing is going to be gone in a, in a while, but a painting, the paint is there. You can see it for more than 30 seconds. A book, that's fixed in a tangible medium. A movie, um, a file on a computer, those types of things would count as something that's protected by copyright because you can see it, it's fixed, and it's there. So the statute also talks about the specific things that it covers. So it's literary, dramatic, musical works. Um, it even includes software. Some people forget about this one, but architecture and even um, choreography is covered by copyright as well. So the next part of copyright, we've talked about the subject matter of copyright. What is copyrightable? Now we're going to talk about what rights do you actually get under copyright. So there are six main rights that you get when you're the copyright owner. So that's the uh, right to copy, uh, reproduce, the right to distribute, the right to display the work, so that's for artworks and things like that, the right to perform the work, so that's musical works, perform them publicly like at a concert, um, and then prepare derivative work. So if you were to make a movie, you have the right to make the next movie, the sequel and that kind of stuff. Um, like the Harry Potter books, if you made the first Harry Potter book, you now have the right to make part two, part three, part four. Nobody else gets those rights. So these rights, we, we think of them as a bundle of rights that you get together, and you can kind of spit those off to people as you see fit. So for example, if you're publishing online, you can say to someone, I grant you the right to distribute my book online, but not actually physically. I'm going to reserve that right for myself. So you can split them up any way you want. Um, I think for today, probably the distribution right and the reproduction right are going to be pretty important because that's what would be contemplated in your publishing agreement. So next, we should talk about what copyright doesn't actually cover. So ideas, things that are not fixed in a tangible medium. So if you're just humming a song and no one's recording it, that's not copyright protected. It was in your mind, you hummed it, it was gone. But if someone has a tape recorder and they're recording it, it's fixed in a tangible medium and you can play that back, that recording would be copyright protected. Um, copyright does not protect titles or names or short phrases. You'll hear people say things like, I want to copyright this phrase or this word. That's a misnomer. What they actually should be saying is, I want to trademark this name or this phrase or this word. Um, it doesn't cover facts, procedures, or processes, um, methods, or concepts. That's more for patent law. So if when you're, um, let's say, if it was Pepsi, the actual 
recipe for Pepsi and things like that, that's a method that they go through that would be covered under patent, not copyright. Um, functionality. So this one gets a little bit tricky, but if something is functional and it's mechanical, then usually that's not covered by copyright either. So for example, for jewelry, the watch, the clasp on the watch, that's functional. It's used to open and close the watch. That would not be copyright protected, but if this was maybe decorative or had a flower that was carved on it, that would be counting as like a sculpture that could be possibly copyright. Does that make sense so far, what I'm saying? So the next part is acquiring copyrights. Um, so with the statutory definition of copyright being fixed in a tangible medium um, and all of that for more than a transitory period of time, that starts at the moment that you create it. So the first time you write that poem, when you're finished, it's protected right then and there. It's on that piece of paper. Um, the duration, single author, this one gets, this one always gets me, so I'm glad I wrote this one down. Um, it's changed a little bit, but single author, you get rights. It's the life of the author plus 70 years. After that time, the work would go into the public domain and there's no more copyright protection for it. Um, and so you can look through there and see the different durations of copyright. They change depending on what's going on, but at some point the work could fall into the public domain and then those six rights, that bundle of rights, no longer exist for that person. So here's some kind of operational or logistical things that we put in as just tips. Copyright notice and registration. So it's advised that you do this, but it's not required in order for you to have rights. Again, you get copyright as soon as that work is finished, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible form. So as soon as you record that song, as soon as you write that book, you've got copyright protection. But here are a few ways that you can do that. You would put the C with a circle around it, and then you put your year of publication, and then your name. So as long as you kind of follow that, that I guess that form, that's how you can actually put a notice on your works and then it basically tells everyone I wrote this during this time I'm the author and then I reserve these rights to myself so copyright registration again it is not required for you to have rights but it's advisable in case there is a lawsuit actually registering your work with the federal government gives you a lot of different rights in case you have to sue Basically, it gives them a way to timestamp and to have your work on file to say this was truly copyrighted. If there were um, a case that came up and you were litigating, you don't have to go through he, he said, she said, like, I wrote this book in 2015. Well, no, I wrote it in 2013. The government will have it on file and will have a date on it and know that was yours at that point in time. Um, when you are litigating, basically, you can get, I guess, trouble damages. Mm -hmm. So three times the amount of damages you would have gotten had you not had the registration on file with the government. So it is a good idea to register this with the federal government. A federal registration, I think, is 35 bucks, and I think it goes up to 65 bucks. So it's really economical to get that registration with the federal government. And just to jump in, if you do it before somebody infringes your work or within a certain period of time, you can get statutory damages and attorney's fees. And that's actually this preferred because where else you're going to have to prove your actual damages. And it's really hard in cases of copyright infringement to prove your actual damages. So a lot of times statutory damages are a lot easier to prove and you get them automatically if there is an infringement. Right. So then the registration process, um, we're not going to go too much in detail. It's, it's not that, that complicated online, but to file with the U.S. Copyright Office, to file with the federal government, you're going to have to um, complete the application form, put the title, author, the claimant, the year of creation, that's important, and then the date of publication. Um, the filing fee, again, is $35. It's $55 done online. That's a new thing. How long ago did they come up with that? It, Two years ago? I think it's 55 if you do multiple works, I think it is. But 35 is online. 35 is online. cheaper to do it online than in paper. They don't want you sending snail mail. <laughs> they don't. don't do that. It's 2016. Just do it online. Um, and of course, government wants their money. Fee is non-returnable. So, all right. That is the end of part one. Are there questions about just copyright in general? One little thing. Or, I'm sorry. I'm the author of work for visual art. Well, right. Thank you for your illustrations. Thanks for the book. Is there anything special?
under the Section 106A attribution. So moral rights is not so much a U.S. right, it's more of a foreign right. A lot of European countries have it, but basically a moral right is just your work of art, the way you intended it to be, you have a right to say, this is the way I want it to be used, and I don't want it to be used in a certain light. So it's, let's say if you were illustrating for a book, and it's a children's book, of course you don't want it to end up into like a suspense book or something that's more for adults, because that's not what you intended. Your moral right would be to say, I want it in this way, and I only want it represented in this way. Does that answer? Okay. Yeah, we'll I'm probably not... save questions to the end so we can move through. Um, I'm going to talk about self-publishing and just and some of the benefits and challenges and maybe some legal issues. I can find my spot back in there. <laughs> um, some of the the benefits associated with self-publishing, as you all may know, is you know you get freedom to publish what you want about what you want when you want, time when you want. You get the final say on all aspects of publication: your cover, um, the appearance price, what goes into the book. Um, it generally, if you're self-motivated, and you know, it can be quicker to get something out there than it would be to get an agent, get assigned a contract, with, find a publisher. Um, so sometimes you can get something out quicker. You can get to retain your IP rights, you may have higher royalties, and let's be honest, readers don't shop for a book by a publisher. They really, they want some, if it's good, it's going to be successful. Um, it's really not the focus, I think, of the of the public. Some of the challenges I think that may you know it, this may be kind of decreasing over the years, but there could be a stigma that it's not as professional or that it's not as polished or sophisticated as a book that's you know picked up by a major major publisher. Um, you are you're not going to have any assistance with the process, you know, cover design, editing, um, printing, marketing, all that. Stuff. Generally, publishers have people at their, at their fingertips to help with all that. Um, you'll also assume all the legal risk and monetary risk. For example, if you you know sometimes if you get a publishing deal, you may get an advance that can be used towards help with editing or cover design, and you may have to pay a third party out of pocket before you get something uh, in the works if you self-publish. Um, for some people, using a traditional publisher may provide you some validation that, oh, my work is successful, I've made it, I got picked up by a great publisher. Um, you may have difficulties getting into major bookstores if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have a recognized publisher. Um, and we're on page uh, 34. So considering all these benefits and the challenges, I think you just have to figure out what's right for you and whether you decide to self-publish or try to find an agent and get a traditional publisher. Uh, if you do self-publish, it's important that you vet your work. Um, you know, it's even important to do this if you use a traditional publisher because most of the time in your publishing contracts, there's going to be warranty and indemnification provisions, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it's really important that you vet your work, make sure you're not using a third party's um, design or images, um, and make sure that your your work is original. Uh, you're not copying it from somebody somebody else. Um, so use original images, graphics, text. If you hire someone to create uh, a design for you for your cover or to create an illustration for use in your book. Be sure to get an assignment of all the copyright rights that they may have in that in that creation um, to you, because you'll want that down the line. Um, if you just if you want to use third party materials, and um, you should look and see if they're in the public domain, if they fall under fair use, and if they're not, then give permission. Um, in writing. In writing, yes. Um, the public domain, you know. If, if a work is published in the United States after 1920 or before 1923 it could be in the public domain uh, things created by federal government employees may be in the public domain uh, you could go on Creative Commons and look to get some images that have been dedicated to the public domain but when you decide to use those you need to make sure you are going to use them for you're allowed to use them for commercial purposes so there may be a restriction on you can only use it for you know just your just your own purpose or nonprofit educational purposes. Fair use is tricky. 
Uh, this is another way that you could your your use of a third party material could be authorized. But fair use is really fact intensive, and the there's a number of factors that a court will consider to determine whether your use is protected under fair use. It's um, the, the four factors are the purpose and nature of the use. So for example, are you using it for, are you using the third party image in a book that you're gonna want to create and sell? That would be for commercial purposes. Generally, let's say then a teacher uses an excerpt of somebody's book for nonprofit educational purposes. That's more likely gonna be considered to be fair use than your commercial printing of somebody else's material would be. So that's one of the factors the courts look to. Um, the nature of the copyrighted work. So it, is it a portion from a book that you're using? The more creative the work that you're using, the, the less likely it's gonna fall under fair use. Um, the amount of work that you use, you know, is it four lines? Is it two words? Um, is it a whole paragraph? Um, the more you use, the less likely it may be fair use. And then the last factor is the effect that your use will have on the potential market for the original copyrighted work that you're using. Um, so for example, is it, is it gonna prevent someone, else, someone from going out and buying that work um, if, if you use it in your own work? Bottom line, it's a defense and it's tricky. Tricky application, tricky elements. Um, so if it's, I think, you know, when in doubt, get permission. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to do, and some people can be difficult in giving you per giving you permission, or could ask for uh, a ridiculous amount of money. But I think when it comes down to it, you may want to really put some thought behind that before you use somebody else's work. Um, getting permission, I think that the you know you allow for at least one to three months, um, especially if lawyers get involved. Because um, they can slow it up the process a lot. Um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, the first thing I think you need to do is identify who the owner of the work is. Um, look for a copyright notice, like Nicole was talking about earlier. Um, you know, once you, you, you figure out who the copyright owner is, sometimes it can be really easy, sometimes it can be difficult. Um, figure out what rights that you need. You know, are you going to be putting it online? Are you going to be distributing? Are you going to be making print editions? Um, and then you'll have to contact the owner and start negotiating for permission. And you know, I would get that permission in writing, like Nicole mentioned early, earlier, um, and do it before you start publishing. Because once you have it in writing and you're you're already wedded to it in your book. Um, then it, it may cost more money. They may realize that and say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're already going forward. I want, I want a lot of money for this, especially if it's already been published and then somebody realizes that you've copied their work. They're going to want a lot of money for it. Or they're going to make you pull your book. So, depending on the nature of who you're talking to. Right. Um, another thing, another thing to keep in mind if you do self-publish to watch out for is um, writing about actual individuals. Um, this could involve, this could bring up um, rights of publicity issues or um, rights of privacy. Um, so your right, your publicity right is the right to control, is some individual's right to control the use of the na their name and their likeness for commercial purposes. So for example, you see this a lot with like athletes on cereal boxes. Um, if somebody did that without getting their permission, that would violate the rights of publicity. Um, right of privacy is your right to be left alone. Um, it could be an invasion of privacy if you start writing about an actual individual uh, and they're identifiable and you, you publish certain things about their life that they didn't want you know, known to the world. Um, where it's a famous person, there's a little bit, a little bit more leeway if you're publishing your opinion um, and it's not something that you know to be false and you're, um, you think would cause them harm, and most people would tend to believe that's where you may get into trouble with famous persons. Um, but keep in mind that that might be something you want to consult with a uh, media, attorney, media attorney or copyright attorney about you know, how far to go on something like that. Also, when you self-publish, um, using trademarks and brand names of third parties, um, this is something you 
you probably don't want to use a trademark or brand name in a negative light in what you publish um, unless there's some compelling artistic reason for you to do so. It'd be better to just create a fictional brand. Um, if you do decide to use somebody's trademark or brand name in your in your publication, um, use it properly. Um, don't, you know, I, I think some people have said, go Google it, you know, go Google it, and that's, that's, that's an improper use of a, a trademark. Um, it should, you should say instead, you know, search the, the internet using Google search engine. Um, so, it, you know, creating a fictional brand is prudent. I think I would, I would consult with somebody about how you're going to be using the name and whether the trademark owner may have an issue with that. Can you give an example mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the exact name of this. Uh, it was a documentary about fast food. Maybe it's called Fast Food Nation or something. I'm not sure, but it was a documentary um, that a gentleman made. I think he was vegan, and he decided to start eating McDonald's like every single day at every meal. And so within his documentary, he actually showed McDonald's. He showed the menu. He showed the golden arches, that kind of stuff. But he's commenting on that trademark. He's actually discussing that trademark for educational purposes. And so it would probably be okay to do something like that. And again, I don't know if McDonald's sued him or not. I know they, they ended up making some changes to their menu after that <laughs> documentary came out. And they added some more healthier options. But that would have been a time where if they sued, he would have claimed fair use probably under that, that type of um, documentary and said, it was fair for me to use the Golden Arches because I was actually talking about McDonald's and I was talking about their menu and I was trying to educate the public about better diet, you know, um, healthier options and things like that. So um, again, fair use is tricky, but when you're using trademarks and things like that, you want to make sure you're using them accurately. If not, then make something up, just make up a brand. So again, with rights, it's best to either um, make up something that is totally doesn't exist so no one can say anything to you about it, um, or use the brand accurately in a way that's factual. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And then, you know, consult with an IP or publishing attorney. You know, you may, they, in some cases, they can give you an opinion. They can read what you're gonna publish and give you an opinion on, you know, whether there's any issues with it. Um, and a lot of times that can be helpful um, if you get an opinion of counsel for combating like, um, a claim that you did it intentionally. Um, or that you, you were targeting their brand and had willful intent in publishing something. Um, you may also want to look to getting liability insurance um, for libel or copyright infringement. Uh, they, if, I know certain companies like the Authors Guild have information regarding certain insurance providers that provide uh, media liability insurance. So that may be something you want to consider as far as cost, whether it's, whether it's worth it. Um, like Nicole mentioned before, register your work with the Copyright Office before it's published. Uh, it's really easy and simple to do. Uh, and then also, once your work is published, look around. You know, police your work. Make sure it's not being infringed by somebody else. And, you know, somebody else is not lifting portions of your work um, or copying what you're doing. I think probably the mechanics of that, the logistics for actually policing your work would be do a Google search. Go ahead and search on Google for, for that and see what comes up. Sometimes you should probably have, you know, Google alerts for your name. Mm -hmm. So you can see if someone's written an article about you, maybe you're reviewing your book. If they're reviewing, it's probably, again, a fair use for them to be able to review your book and maybe take an excerpt. But otherwise, if you find a paper online that's lifted an entire chapter, that's probably not going to be a fair use, and you're going to want to know about that. Mm -hmm. So I would think an online search would be the first um, line of defense for you to police your work. In other words, keep an eye on it and make sure no one's infringing your rights. And so the next section we're going to speak about is, and we're on page, or slide 17, um, is if you do decide to use a traditional publisher, some of the legal issues to watch out for. Um, some of you may or may not decide to hire an agent. And first we'll talk about you know hiring a literary agent and some of the types of agency agreements that you may see. Um, there's an exclusive agency agreement, and an, another type of agreement would be an exclusive right to sell agreement. An exclusive agency agreement, um, and keep in mind that it depends on the state, but if you're going out there and you're getting your um, book 
and you're trying to get it picked up by somebody and you get an agreement with a publisher outside your agent, your agent has nothing to do it do with it, you may not have to pay your agent for because you did the work. Um, but with an exclusive right to sell agreement, even if you do the work and you find who you want to publish, your agent has nothing to do with it, you, you probably still have to pay them under the, that type of an agreement. Um, another clause to watch out for in an agency agreement would be indeterminable agency or agency coupled with an interest. And this would be the exclusive irrevocable right of your agent to represent you, your work for the entire life of the copyright. So for example, if, you're, if your agent gets you a book deal with a publisher and then it ends, um, and then you know you want to walk away from your agent, you're done. You know, um, you may still have an obligation. He may still have the right to continue to get another book deal for you um, for that for that particular work. Um, another thing would be just be wary if there's a clause in there that your agent has the power to sign contracts or checks on your behalf, or the power to sign the agency agreement that you have with him to another agency. You may find yourself working with another agent that you don't want anything to do with um, if he has the right or he or she has the right to assign that agreement without your permission. So agency fees, we're on page ni uh, 19. This, they're typically paid by commission on the sale of your work. Uh, be wary of other fees. Um, the typical commission could be 15% on your income. Um, and then plus 15% of royalties. Uh, sometimes there's some agents that I've heard are offering self-publishing assistance, and they may charge 15% commission on all sales as well. I found that really interesting. It's kind of like, okay, they used to come to us as agents for help, and now people are self-publishing. How can I get in on that? Yeah. I can just kind of nudge and say, hey, I'll help you self-publish, and that's another income stream yeah. for them. So be wary of that as well. And Nicole, I'm going to pass it back to Nicole to talk about um, just some other clauses and traditional publishing agreements to look for. Perfect. And you can look them up as well. Um, so, some other clauses to watch out for in your publishing agreements um, grant of rights clause. So, again, when we were talking about that bundle of rights you get under copyright. A grant of rights clause is where the publisher is going to want everything. It's kind of like the kitchen sink. They're going to try to have every um, rights everywhere. So it could be distribution rights, but they want the rights not just to the physical book if you were doing one. They want the rights to online distribution to ebooks as well. Um, they want the right to distribution if it went international, so not just US, but international, and it just keeps going and going. Um, try to retain you know, your film, your television rights, maybe foreign translation rights. Um, try to retain as much as you can, but at the same time, you've got to know that you want to get picked up by the publisher. So, exactly. So it's just always a balancing act. So, in retaining as many rights as you can, you also want to be smart about what you do want to license. Again, when you have those that, those six rights, you can chop them up any way you want, um, and it depends on kind of your negotiating skills. But you're also, I guess, I call it clout, but mm -hmm. kind of the weight that you can throw around with that. Um, so for the grant of rights clause, uh, we have a broad clause on the following slide that on page 21 that kind of goes over that. You can look over that and keep that for your records in case you want to reference back to something. But we would say that this publisher, this agreement is asking for quite a bit broad rights that you would want to limit and you want to say, okay, I'm going to keep this certain amount of rights, but I'm going to license to you these certain things that I actually need, do need help with. The next um, type of clause we'll talk about is option clauses, and this is the week of on page 22, the exclusive option of your publisher that you've signed with to acquire publishing rights to your next work for a certain period of time. Um, page 23 has a broad option clause. It's basically, you know, the publisher has the option to acquire the publishing rights to the next novel for 60 days. Um, you agree not to submit your work to other publishers during this time period, that you'll negotiate in good faith to come to a deal, and that you can't sign with another publisher unless they give you a better deal than what your current publisher is offering you. And they can match the current publishers, or the, what somebody else is offering you. So 
you know, this may prevent you from going elsewhere if you want to. Um, at a minimum, I would try to get rid of an obligation to submit a completed manuscript to your current publisher. Um, maybe delete or reduce the consideration time periods. You know, maybe if they're 60 days, try to get them to 30. Um, don't get, get rid of any requirement where they require you to publish the book on the same terms as your existing publishing contract. Um, and get rid of the, pub, the stipulation that you can't accept another offer from another publisher if not on the same terms. Um, it may also help to kind of narrow the definition of the next work, you know, same series, same genre, um, maybe some ways to do that. I think your you, a goal or some great provision would be in it, giving your publisher a limited period of time to exclusively consider your work. So if you give it to your publisher for, you know, 30 days, they have the right to look at it before you go to another publisher. If they want it and you can come to an agreement, then you, you go forward with them. If not, then you can go somewhere else. And I think that the main point is when you go into these types of negotiations and you're looking at these contracts, if you're dealing with a publisher, obviously the contract's going to be construed in their favor. So that's why we're sending, like, giving you a list of things to look out for because those are going to be the things that you're going to want to scrutinize a little bit more closely and try to take some things out and put some things in that are favorable to you. Mm -hmm. So the long delays in publication periods, you should be aware of these. Um, these include time limits for consideration of work and for review of revised work. Um, if there's no notice within a certain period of time after the receipt of the revised works is um, would be deemed acceptable. And then to re require publication within 12 to 24 months after the acceptance of work. Um, the non-compete clauses, this, most people are, are a little bit more familiar with this type of clause, but it's an agreement not to publish during the term of the actual contract and sometimes a little bit after the contract uh, without the written permission of the publisher. So it, it's kind of a thing of that distribution right that we were talking about. They're taking that and holding on to that for themselves and saying, okay, you can't publish during the time that we have a contract with you unless we tell you you can and we give it to you in writing. And sometimes if it's just within that year or however the contract is structured, they might say an additional year or something like that because it gives them time to kind of shop around and do things um, that are beneficial to them. So you're going to want to avoid something like that. So an example of a non-complete clause is on the next slide. Um, and you can see in the first one, it again talks about written permission from the publisher. Um, so it kind of locks you in. And then the author agrees that during this term, he will not, without written permission, publish or authorize this to be um, published or publish any substantially similar work. So not only can you not publish your next derivative work, you can't publish anything that's substantially similar. So um, those are things you really want to get rid of. Another clause that is going to be really common and you'll absolutely see in your publishing agreements, and which is why I mentioned earlier that you may want to consider liability insurance, um, are warranty clauses. And this is basically your promise to the publisher that the work is original, that it doesn't violate any other third party's copyright rights, that it doesn't defame an individual, uh, and that you're not invading anybody's rights of publicity or privacy in publishing a work. Um, you're going to see those. I would try to limit it to um, the best to the best of your knowledge standards, so you can kind of get rid of kind of help prevent if you did it inadvertently. Um, but you're gonna you're gonna see those clauses. Another one goes hand in hand with the warranty clause is an indemnification clause, and this is your agreement to reimburse the publisher for any damages suffered by the publisher if you do if if your warranties are false. Um, one way to deal with these may be to request and you know or change the the indemnification provision to make it clear that you're only going to reimburse them after um, final judgment. So if they actually get a judgment against them and they're obligated to pay a certain amount, um, that your your indemnity provision will take effect after that and after their insurance pays. So let's say they have insurance enough to cover the amount of the claim. Um, you also want to make sure that you get notified of the claim and that you can be involved in the settlement process. You'll probably want to hire your own attorney and have them help negotiate. Um, ask, to, ask to be added to your publisher's insurance policy. Um, that may be something that you can get on. And then you can also um, 
assuming that you didn't intentionally do something, you know, and that's where that opinion of counsel may come in handy, um, you would only be entitled for your share of the deductible amount. So those are some ways to combat um, these types of clauses. So the next section is just talking about uh, the wearing of some typical royalty rates. So for um, a hardcover, it's usually between 10 and 15 percent, and I think these are usually they're higher than. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. typical. They're hard in paperbacks, but mm -hmm. then for mass market paperbacks, um, you know, six to nine percent. Um, Ebooks, twenty five percent of net receipts, and I, I think that's probably because they kind of want to get in on that new market. Um, and then subsidiary rights, fifty percent of income. So you're going to want to know what is this percentage based on. So this is a big one for me. I always want to ask, is this based on the net or gross? Because that's going to make a huge difference. Um, for the royalty. If it's based on gross, that's a bigger royalty. Is it based on suggested retail? Uh, is it based on the suggested retail list or the wholesale price? Again, those numbers are going to differ, differ greatly, which means the percentage is going to differ. Watch out for a reduction for discounted sales. So sometimes the publisher is trying to look out for itself and it will say, well, we don't have to necessarily pay you certain amount of royalties if we have to discount the sales of the book. You're going to want to, you know, say, well, no, the book is still being sold. That's kind of out of our control. I still want my royalties. Um, and then advance against royalties. The reason you want to watch out for this is because anytime you're getting an advance, it's like a loan. So if they're advancing you the royalties, if you've gotten it up front, then when the book is selling, whatever period of time that book is selling, let's say for the first six months, if you've already been paid six months worth of royalties, you're not going to get anything for that first six months because they, they already gave you the money as an advance. And when you're negotiating, you may want to ask the publisher for a list of the current discount schedule, you know, where what kind of discounts they're giving, so you can know kind of what your royalties are going to be, and then you can kind of change your contract in light of that. It will scroll. <laughs> That's technology. why we have technology and a printed version. <laughs> um, so also out of print clauses. Um, a grant of rights is generally limited by this clause. Um, it's a link to the publisher's marketing efforts, not just the book's availability. So again, the publisher is trying to look out for itself from a business standpoint in every scenario that can come up. So um, the out of print clause basically is something you really want to watch out for um, because basically it's, it's kind of limiting the life of the book. If it's out of print, then they're not going to want to Pay and then they're not going to want to negotiate for reprinting the book to generate the sales again. Right now, to print could be it could be indefinitely available online, and so you want to limit your, you know, your grant of rights based on when um, they stop market they stop marketing it, rather than if you could still buy it online some random through some random source. So extension of rights clause at termination. Publisher may retain a right to sell and dispose of a certain amount of inventory, essentially delayed extension of grants of rights. Um, and then an early termination penalty, it's money that must be paid by you if you want to terminate the contract early. Instead, it's better to negotiate a waiting period before termination. And then if the contract, um, if the contract is not for a limited term, you can request termination once sales fall below a stated minimum. So you can basically agree this is the minimum that we need to be at before we're going to part ways. Now think, we're on section four. I think just some, on page 31, I think just some key points to remember. Don't assume when you're negotiating this contract that contract terms won't apply to you or this is never going to happen. I mean, I have such a great book. The publisher's never going to be like this to me. You know, he's never going to enforce that section. Don't assume that because you may be wrong. Um, keep your business sense. And what I mean by that is um, you, you got picked up by a publisher. You may have warm, fuzzy feelings towards this publisher, but just kind of put that in a box and put your negotiating hat in another box and just try not to mix the two. Um, you know, ask questions. Um, you know, you can get advice from your publisher about what something means, but you may want to seek a separate, a third party opinion from an attorney or from somebody who has a lot of experience in negotiating publishing contracts because 
you know, you may not just want to rely on the interpretation of your publisher who you're trying to sign an agreement with. Um, you know, if no contract is going to be perfect, so you know, if you need to give up something, just kind of think that through and um, know what you're giving up. Um, I think just you know, ask questions. Don't license away more than you need to. Um, doesn't hurt to push back. You know, if they want the book, they're gonna they're gonna get negotiate with you, or they'll tell you this is standard. We don't change it for anyone, and then you'll just have to consider whether to go forward or walk away. And that is that is what we've prepared. If you have any questions, we're happy to take questions now about the clauses or anything that was yeah, in the presentation. Anything in general.